starting. Okay, yes, I am finally online. Okay, let's see. Let me. Uh, so I had a little uh, mishap. Not mishap. I had a. Um, uh, hold on. Let me just let him send the message. Okay, so I'm sending the uh, link to William Blankenship. He's the uh, author and writer of the Thunder Chickens. So, uh, okay, so we're gonna try this again because uh, we were me and him. We were on video chat before, but it wasn't broadcasting for the reason. I'm still trying to figure out the whole YouTube streaming thing. Um, but <coughs> okay, so while uh, William Blankenship uh, connects to the chat, let me just give a brief about what's going on with all Matt films. So very quickly, Hangman's News will be uh, streaming on television in October. I'm still editing it, but um, uh, took a break from that to work on World Warrior Drake. But uh, the plan for Hangman's News is to be streaming on television. It will be a, a, a pay to view it. So so um, uh, oh. okay. And uh, yes, we are finally live. Excellent. All right. So I'm just re. I'm doing a re recap of of uh, what's going on with me. So I just talked about Hangman's News, the, the, the film that I shot back in 2003. And uh, just briefly, uh, God to Perdition will be uh, showing at the uh, Creepy Freaky Film Fest on October 20th. Uh, so if you're available that day, it's going to be at the Queens Public Library um, in New York. So it's a free event. So come down if you like horror films. Uh, God to Perdition okay. will stream. Uh, I'm still seeing that we're not live on YouTube. Okay, oh, it says I am live right now. It is okay. Yeah. I'm just checking the channel. Um, right, me, I just want you know. Yeah, let me check. Let me ch yeah. check. Let's mm -hmm. see. YouTube is funny that way. YouTube is actually not the the, the the easiest thing to to operate for small content creators like myself. Let's see. No, I understand that. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Uh, I just hate to see yeah. you go through the intro yeah. all over. No, I see it. I see it. We live. Yeah, I'm looking at my video section. It says I'm live right now. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, all right. So very quickly, um, so I'm on page 37 of my Road Warrior Drake graphic novel. Uh, the plan is to go 90 to 120 pages. And then once I'm done with that and I've, I've drawn it and I've digitized, I'm going to go back and then look at certain pages and redraw it and do like a little second draft before I uh, consider it final and then um, get it ready for the second stage, which is the, uh, the publishing part of it, which is right by that point, I'll, I'll have already started my indie campaign. So that's what's going on on my end now uh william had a uh, he uh mispronounced the name of my company which he's not the only one who's done it actually uh, edwin boyette he's done it too and and some other people so the correct pronunciation is alazmat films and uh it's actually an amalgamation of my name so al is you know my first name alberto laz is my baptismal middle name which is lazarus and matt is technically my last name martinez but if i said alazmart it was something like, like a like a Kmart kind of thing, and like now <laughs> that was not professional, so I stuck with Matt. A lot of Matt sounds a little better, so so that's that's the history behind that. So anyway, that's enough about me. So William Blankenship, uh, let's formally welcome you to the chat. How are you, sir? I am doing beautifully. How are you doing tonight? Well, um, I'm not out with the cool kids. I'm not getting drunk. I'm not getting plastered. <laughs> I'm just being a, a funny, duddy homebody at home. So um. I uh, figured let me just reach out to an indie, indie artist like myself and uh, just uh, promote the hell out of them. And let's just have a little chat about our works. And I noticed that your comic book is about uh, a group of anthropomorphic birds. And yep. my comic is about an anthropomorphic bird. So we have that in common. So, What bird is your character? Uh, Road Warrior Drake. Um, he's like a, a – he's got the, the body of the Hulk and uh, the personality of the rock and the uh, – just Ollie, he's a duck, but um, he's a duck. Uh, that's he, awesome. Yeah, so um, yeah, he's actually a character that I created back in '91, and then I drew a few comics with him back in the early '90s, and then I kind of got out of drawing for a little while. And of course, this year, um, being inspired by uh, Thundercats Roar, that that shitty uh, promo that, that they put out, and also what's going on with Comicsgate, I decided to just pick up my pen and start drawing again, and um, I'm like on a drawing warpath since then. So, um. It feels good to go back to drawing. It really does. And I've been very inspired by seeing a lot of indie artists doing the same as well. And then um, when I came across your Twitter and then you had uh, your – yeah, the first 20 pages of your comic um, online, Th The mm -hmm. Thunder Chickens. Let's talk about that. So let's talk about The Thunder Chickens. Um, okay. What inspired you to uh, – first, well, first of all, who are The Thunder Chickens? And then what inspired you to create that story? Uh, the Thunder Chickens is my take on uh, the family dynasty of um, 
of comic books uh, in, in kind of the vein of DC books. Um, how, you know, one uh, character will pass the torch to the next, to the next, but it's uh, familial in that it's a, you know, grandfather, father, son dynamic. Um, and uh, it's it's heavily inspired by my own relationship with uh, my father and my grandfather and how complicated those relationships can be. Um, it was originally just a pitch for a local uh, community college. Um, they had uh, a mascot called the Thundering Chickens. And um, I, I initially did that. And it was initially called the Thundering Chickens, even whenever I first started putting it together in its newest form. Uh, but then I changed it to the Thunder Chickens in the vein of the the thunder the thunderbirds and you know thundercats um just because it rolled off the tongue better um but it, it, it's a lot about um paternal uh relationships and how complex they can be um and it's uh you know a lot of it uh, delves into uh things about um mental illness that i've experienced uh, a lot of it delves into um sort of using um the metaphor of being a superhero for being an artist so um you know and, and a little bit of Jungian psychology mixed in for fun but for the kids you know i was thinking like um there's quite a few animals that no matter how you try to package it that it, it just sounds funny when you do like for example like turtles there's no way you can make a turtle threatening <laughs> and there's no way you can make a chicken unentertaining chickens are just entertaining <laughs> so but it's interesting because you say you tackle things like mental illness and what have you and that's very fascinating so um um explain how that that correlates with your story or is there a character in particular that that uh I guess uh, touches on that particular subject. Oh yeah, there's a character in particular, um, and you know, uh, I'll try to tread lightly because I don't want to give too much away. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, the um, the character that in most books would be the main antagonist um, is the character I have the most sympathy for, um, and I use that as a way to sort of try to explain. I would try to get across um, what it is that I've experienced, um, you know, as being a villain in my own life, so to speak, uh, due to some of the experiences I've had and, you know, the blessing and curse that I've been stricken with, uh, which is, right, you know, um, on paper, bipolar too. Um, but, you know, I've, I've spent uh, uh, a couple of years exploring the ins and outs of what's going on between my ears. Um, and, yeah, I, I want to... Um, I want to take the what is so easily the villainization of mental illness and attempt to show it from the perspective of the person suffering. Um, not in that we're not responsible for our own actions and we're not responsible for what we do and how we do it, but just from a place of understanding that maybe, you know, these people, you know, they may hurt other people simply because they're hurting so much they can't help but spill that pain and suffering out on those that are closest to them. Do you think that artists uh, by nature in their own ways are mentally ill? Um, it depends on your, uh, your definition of mentally ill. I think that uh, if you use the conventional definitions of mental illness, then yes, uh, we all are. We all, we all have our issues. We all, we, we all have this weird obsession with either making pretty pictures or joyful noises. And um, that can hurt us or it can help us or it can do both simultaneously. Because in my experience, um, I've had, I guess for lack of a better term, you know, there's two types of people. There's normies and then there's artists, if, if you want to go with that dichotomy. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess normies uh, look at artists and, and they see certain behavioral ish patterns or certain, um, they hear certain perspectives they give and then they're like, why do you think like that? Or why do you do that? Or like, they'll say things like, oh, you're a little too emotional, you're a little too weird. Or or they, they look at our perspective on things and they, and they tend to see us, and it's a general statement, but I guess I, I'm going by my own experience. They see us as people that are extreme in our views or extreme in, in how we perceive things. Um, you think that's something that, that every artist has? I think, I mean, well, one, that's that's a very binary statement. And I, I do my best to avoid blanket statements because they don't cover everything. Um, however, um, 
what I think is that we can turn the normies into artists because they just don't realize their potential. They don't realize um, that they have that inside them. They want to create. And, and this is me going psycho spiritual on you for a moment. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm not a Judeo Christian uh, um, theologist by any means. But if we are, as it is said, made in the image of God, well, God created all of this that's in front of us, you know, that's right there. Uh, he created it of himself. And that's what artists do. So if we're made in the image of God, then our purpose on this earth is to create, not just artistically, our biological purpose is to create more people, to biologically create a baby. Um, so even on a fundamental, completely and totally, you know, agnostic level of thinking, our purpose is to create more, you know, and, and there can be so much said that's spiritual about having a child. And that's a big part of it, at least in my own experience. Um, but on another level, um, we are here to create beauty um, because it's beauty that fights against the darkness. It's the light. It's the small amount of light at the end of the tunnel that you chase after that beauty. You know, it's a good point about um, we are all creators. And then I, I've thought of that, but I've never heard anyone else say that. So I'm glad you actually said that because I agree with that part of, of, of our makeup that we are all creators and in some ways we, we are all artists. Not that we can create the same thing because if we did, it'd be kind of boring. But I think if, like you said, if we all met our full potential, we'd be creating some very beautiful things. And it's I, I think it's tragic that a lot of people don't meet that potential. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot and, and there's a lot of things that people can't offer. Like the way I view, and I'm not trying to be self-serving, um, but the way I view my talents, I view it as a gift that I want to give to the world. I want to give to people. Yeah. Uh, because to me, it's a crime that if you're good at something or you're creative at something, why shouldn't you share it with people? Why shouldn't you? And to cycle back to like the mental illness thing, there are so many, I know so many of the greatest artists who are stricken with mental illnesses in a way that stops them from creating, that stops them from reaching their full potential. And it is our duty. It is our blessing. It is our curse to do it for those who can't so that we can be an example for them, for to, to show them that you can get to the other side of it and say, no, I will not let the demons of fear and doubt control me. I will do what I am here to do because there are so many people who are locked up inside the cages of their soul who can't get out unless we show them the light. And that light is the beauty of creation and art. Now, what do you take? What do you think you'll be taking Thunder Chickens to? Uh, based now, based on what you just said, how, what is your plan with the the Thunder Chickens? Um, my plan is to explore um my own psychology with it, my own the depths of my own mind, and, and as I create it, I find um things that weren't there plan to begin with and that's the the that's the fascinating thing is that there's things like um uh, at the AUC at the end of the 20 pages that I have up right now um scratch uh puts on like the dark edgy 90s s costume and uh you know wants to go out and and, and be this sort of little edge lord and that as I look back on it you know once I got to the point where I was doing this face oh he's exploring his own shadow this is Jungian psychology made for kids and you know that's what I'm trying to do is put something that's um, use metaphors that are practical enough to explore very dense and heavy subjects that people have problems with, um, you know, whether it be psychological, whether it be philosophical, whether it be spiritual, in a way that even kids will, even if they don't get 100% of what I'm putting in there, will get it because I didn't even get 100% of what I'm putting in there. I only realized that that was an, a young and exploration of the shadow after I had already drawn that page. No, that's it's a lot to process, but um, I was <laughs> I, I was thinking, is there any subject that you feel you won't touch on, or you feel like you're not, not 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 I don't say not qualified, but do you feel like that you don't that you wouldn't want to touch for reasons that you feel like you're not um, that you, you know you feel um, well, like I guess um, intimidated in terms of whatever backlash or consequence could come of it. Um, not really. I think that all subjects are on the table if they're done 
in a way that is honest. However, in Thunder Chicken specifically, I have limited myself in ways. I, I uh, uh, will not use guns in any way that is um, that is glorifying the use of them. I do use like laser guns because you know, much in the Star Wars way of like getting around the uh, around the um, the hurdle. Um, so, but I, I won't use guns unless I intend to make a point. And it's not that I don't like guns. It's not that I'm anti-gun. I'm not by any means. I think everybody should, um, I think everybody should have the freedom to do what they will with what they have responsibly. Um, but I'm using, uh, guns in the story as, uh, as little and as responsibly as possible just to show how if they're used irresponsibly they can cause great damage i haven't figured out where that's going to come from yet but i know that it's going to come i've just avoided you know having guns being just thrown around in it because one it's a kid's book and i want it to reach as broad of a market as possible um but two it's also um it's just how I feel about it. I, you know, I, I, I think responsible gun owners have every freedom to own whatever gun they want, um, regardless of what people think about, you know, AR-15s or machine guns or whatever. You know, Hunter Thompson is one of my heroes, and we'll get back into that once we talk about Comics Gate. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, he used to just he'd shoot uh, machine guns at um, at um, uh, can canisters full of. Um, oh, gas up uh, propane he'd shoot guns at canisters full of propane and blow them up for fun but he would never use them irresponsibly you know some people might look from the outside and go oh he's a madman yes he was but he was a beautiful madman um but he never harmed another person with a gun he only used them for his own entertainment person purposes mm, fascinating fascinating um yeah no, it, it definitely shows that the, you have a, a plan as far as world building, because world building is very important with stories, especially yes. uh, in comics. So, um, no, it, it's good to hear that because that, it actually gives more depth to your story. Um, and actually, it's very fascinating too. Um, well, let's talk about comics, case since you brought it up. Um, well, first, let me ask you: have, Has anyone ever called you a Nazi yet? No, I haven't. But that's what kind of got me interested in it. I, mm -hmm. I found like anytime a lot of people are calling um, people like uh, uh, putting a blanket statement of all oh, their Nazis over top of um, any kind of movement or anything. then I want to explore and see what's really going on because mm -hmm. I, I imagine that or at least what I found in, in my own sort of um, experiences is that those we easily vilify, there's usually a reason behind it. Um, but um, so far, um, I've explored it with the same uh, level of bronzo journalism um, that Hunter Thompson did, which is I have attempted to embed myself into the movement in a way that I'm, I'm not just repeating what I see as much as I've attempted to um, appoint myself the shaman of comics gate. And I call people out so much for just being dickheads because, we, you know, you don't need to do that. You know, you, you can you can make those who would want to be your enemies, your friends with the right sort of tact and artful discussion. I definitely agree that and, and, and something you said just triggered a thought, which is when it comes to comics gate as a, as a movement, I think it's important that we are individuals you said about not repeating what others say. Yes. Um, I'm very, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think um, it, because I, I, I take pride in being part of, part of Comics Gate, uh, but I won't necessarily delve into any drama. Like I won't necessarily go in to just pick a fight with people or yeah. to join in a fight just because I say I'm Comics Gate. Not yeah. that I agree with, with for example, Robbie Rodriguez uh, tweeting a picture of his anus on Twitter, which is disgusting. Or yeah. or Bill Sakewich saying the crap he's been saying, but I'm not gonna go on Twitter and say, okay, this guy said this about comics. Let me go in and and, and now get into a flame war, because to me it's a waste of time. Because I, I I'm doing a comic book and I want to promote the comic book. I want to yeah. spend my time promoting the comic book and networking with people, uh, and it, and that that means networking maybe with people that may not see comics get in a positive light. And just show that hey, look, I'm I'm an artist. I, I I just want entertainment, entertaining comics. I want inspiring stories. 
I want to network with people who think the same as well. Uh, you know, I, I want to uh, encourage an atmosphere of art and, and creativity and entertainment. Um, for that reason alone, I'm a part of Comics Gate, and that's what I want to focus more on. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you say you're like a shaman type person. Um, I think it's important that we bring ourselves, whether it's our individual skills, individual talents, or individual personalities into the movement, because one of the things they say about comic skate is that we're all right wing, uh, neo Nazi, white nationalists. And I'm like, there's a lot of people in comic skate that aren't even right wing. And there's a lot of minorities in there as well. So, yeah. you know, I mean, what do you think about all that? Um, well, one, I, to quote Marilyn Manson, I'm not right wing or left wing because you need two wings to fly. Right. Um, and uh, the way I see it, these people who choose one side or the other are simply flying in circles because they can do nothing else. Um, I've actually uh, befriended white supremacists. Um, it wasn't a choice. I was in a cult at the time. That's a long story. I have an article about it up on Bleeding Cool. I'll link you to it. Okay. Um, but um, I'm reminded always of Dave B. Um, it was a, uh, a cult that was masquerading as uh, Narcotics Anonymous. Um, however, they were extremists. I had to... Um, I had to give up my apartment. I had to give up my job. I had to, for the first uh, uh, 90 days, I had to be with, around babysat basically by somebody who had 90 days clean already all day so that they knew I wasn't getting high. I slept on people's couch. I slept on people's floors. I asked people to buy me cigarettes. I asked people to buy me food. It was a cult. Um, it was just an overzealous form of Narcotics Anonymous. And that is beside the point because I still have friends in that group. However, I'm always reminded of Dave B. Whenever I look at the sort of um, uh, the the neo Marxist liberal front that we're facing in this country, in that um, one story, uh, there was a guy named Hodge. Hodge was a black guy, and Hodge was the most. Um, stereotypical black guy that if I wrote this character, you would call me a racist. Like you would think like, Oh, he's just, no, he Hodge was Hodge and Hodge was a beautiful motherfucker. So am I allowed to swear? Go for it. Okay. Hodge was a beautiful motherfucker and I loved him. And unfortunately he went back, he started smoking crack again. And I, I hope that he's doing as best as he can. But Dave B uh, was taking me to um, Walmart to cash my check one day. Um, because I needed to get money in my pocket. I was, you know, obviously going, you know, week to week, um, uh, working at a farm that was tightly connected to this cult, um, Uniontown Saturday night down in Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Um, and I would still recommend anybody who's struggling with addiction to give it a chance because the people who succeed there succeed very well. But Dave B was taking me to cash my check at Walmart. And, uh, I had known Hodge was all day was like, man, I'm trying to get to water. I'm trying to get to, I mean, I need to cash my check. I need to cash my, I mean, and you know, anybody's got to get, man. And so he was trying to get to Wally world. He was trying to cash his check. He was trying to get money in his pocket as well. But Dave B he had SS and 1408 on his knuckles. All right. But I had gotten clean with him and I had, and I'm not to this day. I, I mean, I'm, drinking right now. As a matter of fact, I realized only recently I have two beers open, so apparently I'm double fisting it. Um, but, you know, I found a way to manage that. Well, Dave B, he was a, he believed in white supremacy. Then that was his wrong-headed belief, and I didn't hold it against him. In fact, I would call him out on it often and say, well, you know, Dave, you don't really look like a fine example of the supremacy of the white race. You know, your chin's a little bit sunk. Um, but Dave B took me to Walmart. I cashed my check. We came back. And as we pulled up, Hodge comes out on the porch and he goes, Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, man, what are you doing? Hey, I'm trying to get to Walmart. I need to cash my check. So, and I was like, yeah, I know. I like, I, I knew he needed to cash his check, but I didn't say that you were taking me there because, um, you know, I know you're not a fan of the blacks. Um, so, uh, Dave told me, he goes, you know, Sean H asked me today, um, if you, if I asked you to sponsor a white, uh, black guy, would you? And I said to him, well, Sean, recovery comes before racism. 
And Dave B took Hodge to go cash his check uh, that day. And he uh, helped out anybody in the group, anybody, no matter what color, no matter what creed, no matter what religion, because for him, recovery and helping another addict get another day clean was more important to him than his wrongheaded beliefs. And my problem with the liberals that I see nowadays is they cannot live up to the standards of a white supremacist, of a self-declared white supremacist with 1488 on his knuckles. That sounds like a good story to tell, um, either through film or, or comic. That's actually like, wow, because um, like you just said, like, like the, they all share a common goal. Like you, yeah. they put they put aside ideology and shared a common goal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of like that kind of describes Comics Gate in a, in a nutshell. It's we're all putting aside our own ideologies and coming together for a common goal. Yeah, uh, it's it's a beautiful thing actually. I think. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, yeah. I, I mean, I quit my job on a whim. Like, uh, like I could just couldn't do it anymore. Like, and this was last week. Mm -hmm. And within an hour, in a Comics Gate chat on um, Ethan Van Siver's live stream. I got two offers for, you know, books. Um, and, you know, they, they haven't come through yet. I'm still web slinging between gigs. Oh, pardon me. I'm still web slinging between gigs. But it got rid of that fear in that, like, oh, these people are so supportive and they 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 like what I do and they're they you know they 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 want me to make them look good. And that made me go, you know what? I shouldn't fear. I shouldn't doubt. I need to just follow this path because, you know, what can I say? The voice told me to, you know? Yeah. You know, it, there's definitely a lot of fear and doubt when um, you're, you're starting out or when you actually take the next step, which is now people are showing some interest. Um, but it, I mean, once you're there, it's, it's awesome because now it's like you're, you're in control of that steering wheel and you're just uh, taking your business or your brand uh, where you want it to go. Um, what do you, so are you sticking with the, the web, um, format for Thunder Chickens or do you plan on doing like physical copies of? I don't, well, I, I, I eventually plan on having physical copies of it. Um, right now it's just, I put up the 20 pages that are done simply because I felt I needed to pull the trigger on it. And, um, I've got a lot of irons in the fire right now in terms of projects and I'm just kind of seeing which one catches to see where I need to go. But Thunder Chickens will always be my heart and it's always going to be what I come back to. I'm just hoping that I can find a gig that sustains me financially and in a way that I'm, I'm happy with creating um, on, you know, a paid gig. Uh, which I haven't in the past, but we'll get into that. Um, that I'm happy with creating on a paid gig where I can spend my spare time working on Thunder Chicken so as to just create the best possible product that I can, the best possible story, and not in a way that I'm I'm attempting to do something that is second guessing what the audience wants because if the audience knew what they wanted, they wouldn't be the audience, they'd be the artist. I'm, I'm attempting to do something that, you know, kids will love but parents will watch with their kids and go oh this is on some whole other shit mm. i like that mentality because that's 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 really the one that type of what drives you to actually take that step and say okay now i'm gonna just produce it like there are people that want to tell a story as we discussed earlier everybody has that creative drive but not everybody actually fulfills that drive and you got those that, that once they they have that inspiration they just say okay pick up the pen and i'm gonna just produce it and tell that story See, but you know what? I, I, in fact, I have this um, friend, Hannah Ghost. Um, she's an amazing musician, and still, she's been doing music for a decade and hasn't released like any of it really. And I've been talking to her on, for because we're working on a music project together, um, and she keeps sending me tracks, and I just keep loving it. I'm like, oh, you don't even know, girl. You don't even know. You're so good. I need you to be doing your stuff so that I can do my stuff because I feed off what you're doing. It's my fuel. All I'm doing is shitting out what I eat in other people's creative pursuits. You know, all, mm -hmm. all that I have is my shit. 
That's all. And that shit is made of what I see other people doing creatively. And I need that. I need it. I need to see you doing – what's the name of your comic again? Road Warrior Drake. I need to see you doing Road Warrior Drake because that's going to inspire me to do the next page of Thunder Chickens. That's going to inspire me to hustle harder. That's I need that. And we all need that. But the problem is, is so few people are supportive of their fellow artists in a way it takes so little. It takes so little to, to, to say, no, you're doing some amazing stuff. All it takes is a few words and people will run with it for miles. But we're so afraid of like opening ourselves up and being vulnerable that we don't really just let ourselves dive into how much we're loving seeing what one of our friends or one of our compatriots in this struggle are doing. And we all need to be telling the other motherfucker, no, you're beautiful. You're fucking beautiful. You know? And that's something that I, as, as a, I'm just naturally an introvert, and that's been, I guess, one of my biggest drawbacks as an artist is that I can do so many things creatively, but as far as marketing, that's where I suck at because it takes that that connecting with people, networking with people, and actually net networking with fellow artists and yeah. pushing them. I've, I haven't been good with that up until this past year, and I made it a, a personal commitment, a personal goal to say, you know what? I'm going to connect with fellow artists. I'm going to look at their stuff. I'm going to encourage them. I'm going to be inspired by them. And I want to inspire other artists. And one of the things I said I was going to do was promote other artists and build that network and create a community or be a part of a community where, like you said, we can say, hey, that's some good shit to keep mm -hmm. doing it because that's going to make me want to create more. And that's, that's again, why, why I love Comics Gate is because it inspired me to just pick up my pen after five or so years and get back into drawing and i've been drawing like like crazy i haven't drawn as much that i've been drawing since my high school years that's how how long it's been since i've actually been drawing like this dude you're gonna I'm, I'm telling you what a year from now you're gonna look back and you're gonna go oh man i have excelled so far from where i was and 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 that's the thing is uh, oh, i'm sorry so i had a thought but it, i lost it but beside the point um yeah you we need to be that's the one thing that I really see in comics gate in the movement um, that has me inspired as I see people being so supportive, like, so like, like sharing each other stuff. And I've got, I've actually got um, the, we are comics gate uh, Twitter is going to be sharing some stuff that uh, I'm going to be releasing here soon, which is uh, as I like, to label it the illegal redistribution of art mm -hmm. and all i'll say right now is it might piss off a little company called action lab but um you know i think that they'll benefit from it in the long run i just uh am, am playing my cards as best as i can but yeah keep Keep a lookout for the illegal redistribution of art. Well, sometimes you have to toe that line, or you got to ruffle a feather here or there just to get yourself out there too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, of course you. People love, and that's the thing, and and that, that ties into um, my sort of my beliefs in in what I call the unified narrative theory of existence, which is it all comes back to um, the Shakespeare quote: um, "All the world's a stage; the men and women merely players." Um, you cannot avoid the drama. And even if you could, you wouldn't want to. You would choose not to because that's why we're here. We're here for the drama. Drama has such a bad connotation to it. But no, we're here for the narrative of existence. Because if, if as Terrence McKenna says, um, culture is just the operating system of the human species, then the coding language of that operating system is narrative and story. Facts don't do shit. And that's a problem. All right. That's a problem because if facts did shit, then we would be on some super space travel shit right now, but we're not because a narrative story, a, a simple a simple story about one person's experience can crumble a million facts if if that narrative is posed correctly and put in front of the correct audience. Um, the you cannot escape it. You can't escape the drama. And sometimes it's fun to 
play to the drama because people are going to buy into it. People want to buy into it. People want to buy tabloid magazines about what the Kardashians are doing. People want to, they want to know the dirt about what's going on behind the scenes. They, they, they don't want to see the veneer, the soft edges that we make to advertise, advertise ourselves. They want to see the humanity, the, the dirty, nasty, vengeful, envious humanity that we are underneath that's what they want and right now all the all the bubbling of how would you say all the bubbling of um cultural and social issues that you see right now is simply a fluid culture boiling to the point of becoming a culture of steam so what we need to do is just keep that bubbling going until the breaking point where the steam starts rising because that's the next level that's the next evolution i think it's i think it's very important for uh, especially for upcoming artists that they <laughs> understand that like you said drama is inescapable uh yes. I, I think that uh the ones that stick around are the ones that know how to harness that drama and actually let it work in their favor yeah, um, and I think with Comicsgate, there's a, so much drama, and um, a lot, and, and a lot of what's been said has been very harsh, and mm -hmm. I can see it being very, um, very intense and overwhelming. I think of um, uh, Peter Semeny and Alternate Comics, and what oh, he's God, what, yeah. what he went through, and I, I'm surprised that he he, because I haven't heard, read anything he did that was anything aggressive towards anybody. He was just no. you know, an indie he's guy, a human being. Yeah, he's an indie guy unto himself, pushing comics, just you know. Uh, publishing entertainment and then he got embroiled in, in, in this nastiness and <clears throat> but he he did it you know what he did it the right way he, there's actually quite a few ways you can handle the drama and he he embraced it with humility like he didn't go back and and not that he he not that i you know i don't think he shouldn't but he chose not to go back with, with a flaming sword he actually instead just embraced the, the support that the, the community gave him and then with went with that and it's only helped his stock even more and I admire that. I now personally, for me, I, I'm the kind of guy that if I'm attacked, I'll probably bring my my flaming sword and fight back. I, I I don't know if I would stay quiet, but I can learn from someone like Samedi. I can I can learn from someone like say Mike Zero, for example, when he, Ryan Johnson went after him not too long ago. Yeah. I don't know about I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, oh, I need to I need to check it out. I'll okay. follow. Yeah. Oh, oh so um, Ryan Johnson, um, you know, the director of the Last Jedi, Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he went after Mike Zero, and Mike Zero. Didn't say a word about it until he uploaded a review of the Last Jedi on his YouTube channel, and that's when the shots were fired. But, um, but, uh, but they they taught me that sometimes humility is a strong weapon, much stronger than 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 the sword. Um, you know what's a stronger weapon? The strongest weapon you have as an artist is vulnerability. Vulnerability is the strong, and it's the hardest. It's the hardest to flay your chest open and show your heart and say, go ahead, stab it if you will, but I will not hide it. Um, would you, and we talked a moment ago about insecurities and because I've dealt with that too in terms of not being able to promote my stuff. Would you guess from talking to me that I am the most insecure fucking person you will ever meet? Not that I not guess that, but I would probably say I'm probably more secure than you are. So, you know, uh, I never would have guessed it. No, I, and, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, all that I have in my head is a hype man. We all need our own Flava Flav in our head. And the thing is, most people don't know about Flava Flav. He's actually a musical genius. He plays 13 instruments. He does so much of the music for uh, Public Enemy, which mm -hmm. if you haven't listened to their most recent stuff, their best stuff is their most recent stuff. Fuck, fuck fear of a black planet. Um, get like how, how to sell soul to soulless people who sold they soul. That's that's the shit. Mm -hmm. um, or um, uh, the evil empire of everything. Um, yeah, we all need a flavor flav in our head. And I simply play the character of the hype man in my head because I know that if I don't, I don't get the chance 
to show another motherfucker love and light and how to get out the other side of the tunnel because I've been through the dark night of the soul. I've been through Chapel Perilous. I've been in that place where you're lost and you're swimming in shit and you don't know which direction is up, but you just have to keep swimming, as they said in Finding, Do Finding Nemo. I've been there. And it's and I know what it's like. And when this cast is over, I'm going to listen to some sad songs. I'm going to cry a little bit. I might look at pictures of my daughter and weep a little bit. And, and I'm going to go back to being that guy. But as we're on air and as I'm able to spread this message, I'm going to do it as emphatically, as passionately as I can, because there is no other choice. There is no room for fear. There is no room for doubt. Those are demons. I don't care whether you believe in exorcism, whether you believe in people being, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Being uh, uh, compelled by a demon, being... Um, you know, what, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. Being possessed, yeah. Possessed, being possessed. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you're possessed by a demon or you're possessed by an idea. You are possessed either way. And that counts for all ideologies, left, ring, white, left wing, right wing, any and all of them. That, that counts for um, mania. That counts for depression because people can become so manic. And I have been that you get delusions of grandeur. Uh, where you think that you're something greater than you're not. You're so depressed that you get these delusions of being so worthless that I can't, I just can't. I, 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 I'm, I'm not fit for it. I'm not cut out for this. No, fuck that. That's a demon. I don't care if I'm speaking metaphorically or literally. That's a demon. And if you're possessed by the idea that you're not good enough, you need an exorcism, motherfucker. We need to call in priests. You know, before I did the, ch the, the live stream tonight, um, I had a thought in my head, which was, and I've always had this thought, but it, it, I forget about it and then it pops up again. Um, pain. Pain, for me, there's two types of motivations, pain and romance. Yeah. Um, pain actually motivates a lot of my film work. And I think romance motivates my, my, my comics, which is interesting because um, Solomon's Requiem, which is a horror film I did back in 2002, a zombie film on 60mm yeah. film. Uh, when I was writing the screenplay, a lot of it was motivated by pain. Um, I gone through a breakup. I was unemployed. Um, I felt worthless. I felt like um, I was being left behind. And through that pain, I concocted a, a comedy horror film. Uh, Hangman's Noose, um, uh, black and white sci-fi film. Pain. Pain because of the, I was mourning this world. A world that, to me, was self-destructing and divided. And uh, seeing our freedoms being taken left and right, that pain motivated me to write that story. And then God the Perdition, my, my latest horror film, is motivated by real life pain of what I'm going through with my my son. You mentioned uh, your daughter. My son, yeah. I was supposed to see my son this weekend, but uh, because of the ambiguity of the current court order, his yeah. mother made it impossible for me to see my son. So now my I can't spend time with my son this weekend, in spite of the fact that my son's therapist has told his mother that he needs to spend more time with his dad. You think she gives a fuck? She don't give a fuck. So, she, so therefore, that pain, which I'm still experiencing right now motivated me to not only just continue working on my comic but reach out to you and say hey do you want to do a live stream tonight and just yeah. shoot the breeze so pain motivates my art more so my films than anything <coughs> but the romance part of it motivates my comics and when i say romance i mean like um in the beginning years ago uh you know the idea of luring, luring a, a, a female with my artwork, and then today trying to impress my wife or trying to um, you know show her that yeah you know on the outside I'm gruff on the outside I'm I'm, I'm the guy with rules I'm the I'm the uh, alpha male uh, semi jealous semi you know crossing boundaries kind of man, but beneath that there's a a man that that creates and has a romantic view of of life around him and he puts that on paper. So that motivates that. Yeah. No, that's that's beautiful. And, and that's the thing is the pain can be beautiful in that it uh, – oh, wait. Let me – let me turn that on. Um, the pain, um, it can be beautiful in that it is the catalyst for transformation. 
It is the catalyst for self-transformation. And transformative work is transformative. Um, anytime you're remixing what you are influenced by to create something new, that work is going to be transformative in your life, in your mind, in your soul. And I might get a little, I might get, my, my voice might break up a little bit. Uh, uh, all right. And, and, and I've been walking a tightrope in terms of this, so I won't say much. Mm -hmm. But um, I got to talk to my daughter for the first time after a year and a half. Um, she's five now. And I got pictures from my ex-wife of her on her first day of school. And she was beaming, just smiling as happy as you can imagine someone being because she was excited to make new friends. And that's what motivates me is that little girl, you know, and uh, it, it, I know how hard it can be. I know, I know how hard it can be at the worst. And I'm not trying to say like, I've had it worse. I'm, I'm just saying, I know how hard it can be even when you don't have one weekend. Um, and that's, that's that's the that's the thing as i said before in terms of being made in the image of god and creating you know i created this beautiful little girl and now this beautiful little girl is saving my soul you know from the depths of the fucking darkness and for you i'm sure you feel the same way about your kids you know and i hope that after this stream is over i hope you give your wife a big old fucking kiss on the cheek and you tell her i fucking love you girl you don't even know and you hug her as tightly as you can because she deserves that and you deserve that and you know like I said, there's no room for fear. There's no room for doubt. You have to, if you know, not think, not believe, but know deep down in your soul that what you're doing and the path you're walking is right for you. It may not be right for everybody. Somebody else might see your path and they might say, no, nah, that's the wrong path. Well, that's the wrong path for you, brother, but it's the right path for me. If you know deep down in your soul that this is the path I need to walk, then you walk it. And you walk it with your head held high, with your chin up, with your shoulders out, and with your palms out. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No, it's it's a, yeah, exactly. It's we all have our own individual paths, and um, uh, how we interpret that path. I think that that's the uh, the sign of a successful artist is how you, well you interpret your path and tell that story. Yeah. Um, so, what's up with you? I want to ask you some questions. What okay. what what drives you, what, what drives your inner dynamo? Like what inspires you? What, like, you know, what's some of your favorite shit? What's just, what, what drives your inner dynamo? Well, tonight I was watching, um, Stanguli on me TV and he was showing, Oh, you like Stanguli. <laughs> they were showing, they were showing Rodan. Yeah, I'm sure you've Rodan. seen Rodan. Yes. I, I, I'm a oh. huge Godzilla film. Godzilla film. Oh, awesome. I have the Godzilla DVDs. I actually, um, I have, um, a lot of the Bandai's, not all of them, because I'm not a huge fanatic, but I have some of the Bandai's, and uh, I've uh, been keeping in updated on the new NECA Godzilla figures that are going to be coming out, so I'll be collecting those. Um, but Godzilla has been one of the biggest influences in my life. Um, uh, as a boy watching those movies, I said, you know what, I want to tell those kind of stories. I want to tell stories of of like of the awesome or the amazing. Like yeah. I want to be able to tell my own stories of awesome and amazing characters. And characters that give me goosebumps, you know, I want to be able to give goosebumps, get goosebumps from people, from characters that I've created. I would take a, uh, a, a, a educated guess that maybe you sympathize with the monster because you know that monster inside yourself. Oh, let me tell you, um, someone, someone, someone put this uh, very, very beautifully accurate. Godzilla is a monster who is the only surviving member of his species in a mm -hmm. world that hates him. Who in his shoes wouldn't set fire around you? But we're all in those shoes. We right. all feel alone, even though we're we could be surrounded by people. We could be in a bar full of people, and you're the it man, and everybody's coming up to talk to you, and you still feel alone. You still feel like they don't understand because that's the human experience of 
we are all one, but we feel so isolated from one another. And that's the thing we need to destroy. That's the real monster, the illusion of isolation. It's not Godzilla we need to blow up. It's not Godzilla we need to attack with laser beams. It's not Godzilla we need to defeat. We need to defeat that lie that we are not one because we are all the same. We are all connected as I'm trying to think of how uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson put it. We're connected um, on the earth biologically um, and we're connecting, we're connected in space atomically. You know, we're all made of stardust. We're all beautiful, bright, glowing beings made of stardust. But everybody just wants to say, no, you're little me. You're little me. You can't do nothing. You're little me. You're li how can you do something? You're so small. You're so helpless. You're so incomplete. You're so not perfect. How could you do anything? No, fuck that. It just takes the fact that we need to come together as artists. We need to come together as people, regardless of our wrongheaded ideas and say, no, nah, together we can make something beautiful. In fact, we can make heaven on earth if we wanted to. But sometimes I don't think we want to because, again, we cannot escape the drama. And even if we could, we probably wouldn't want to. I also think it's because we're so conformed with accepting status quo also. Like, say, for example, with comics, if it's not DC, Marvel, or Image, then we don't take a second look at it. And yeah. and we don't realize that just because it's not among the big two or the big three doesn't mean that it isn't good. As, of, as what we've established, some of what's in the big three is actually crap. So who's to say that what's, not, what's outside the big three might not be even better? Um, and I think we, 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 we're afraid to take the risk of going outside what's been given to us and seeing what's out there and experience. Ex exploring and discovering newer, fresher, beautiful um, pieces that are out there or, or visions that are waiting to entertain us. And, um, you know, it, I think it's that uh, we're just comfortable with status quo too. But also part of the problem is um, playing to the crowd. As I said before, and that's a quote from Alan Moore, um, you can't try to play to what you think the audience wants because if the audience knew what they wanted they wouldn't be the audience they would be the artist and the problem is is everybody is attempting to play to the crowd when you need to put again be vulnerable flay your heart out and put it on the table and say this is me with whatever you're creating regardless of how people perceive it um, one of my favorite musicians who's actually from my hometown is Daniel Johnston, and he is bipolar. Um, he's severely mentally ill. Um, thankfully, you know, he has great parents who help him every step of the way and manage his career. And now he is one of the most, um, most sought after independent artists of his era because there? he cannot stop. Oh, we froze. We froze. What's going on? We froze. Oh, we froze. Oh, no. What froze? Did I freeze or did you freeze? Uh, hello, you there? Oh, there we go. There oh, we okay, go. Great. Yeah, uh, froze great. for a second. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Daniel Johnston, um, and, and there's a fascinating documentary which partially was filmed in my hometown called The Devil and Daniel Johnston, um, and it's about his struggles as an artist, and eventually, um, you know, he was able to, uh, in his own path, in his own way, uh, find the place he was looking for um, in terms of uh, being a creative spirit that he so in, in, in his music, it bleeds with that desire to be a well-respected artist to, to, to be, you know, there's, there's a song called story of an artist by Daniel Johnson. That is, it's, it's beautiful. And I, if you've never listened to him, I would recommend it. It's some of the most raw, um, recordings you will ever hear in terms of production, because every time, 
Every time he gave out a new copy of his album, he had to re-record it from scratch. He wasn't able to dub. So every all of his early stuff when he was in high school and in college, he couldn't dub it and just record it, re-record it, you know, redub it and send out another copy. He would have to re-record it from scratch. Like he would have to replay it and re-record it every time. And that is a passion I aspire to. That's a passion that I'm like, oh my God, this broken individual so full of pain can do this. How can I not? How can I not put everything into it? If this man can do this and make something beautiful out of it, how can I even falter? How can I listen to any of those fears? How can I listen to any of those doubts? Because they are nothing but liars and demons in my head, regardless of whether you take that metaphorically or literally. One of the biggest fears, as, as from what I'm hearing you saying, which I, I actually agree with, and I'll explain why, is the fear of opening up as you said, being vulnerable, opening your heart up, it's, yeah. the, fear, it's the fear of, of of being different from the mainstream. I yeah. remember when I was in high school, the big thing was anime. Uh, the big thing was Dragon Ball Z when I was in high school. And every other kid in, in, in class, in, in art class, uh, they would draw, you know, anime style characters. And I'm like, okay, that's nice. But what, what are you? Like, I'm thinking to myself, where's your style? Like, that's not yeah. your style. You could draw it nicely, but that's not your style. Like my style, um, I'm not gonna say my style is. Uh, how can I put it? Like I can draw certain characters really good. I can draw animal characters good. I can draw anthropomorphic characters good. Human yeah. being, human beings, I I can draw okay, and I have my own style. But that's what it is. It's, it's my style. It's not. It's not uh, comparable with someone like a Jack Kirby or, um, you know, Steve Ditko, or, th or those guys. But it's my own style. But I'm I'm okay with sharing that because. It's it's me. It's my style. It's my heart. It's my vulnerability. Uh, and I think a lot of a lot of artists who are afraid because they're afraid of being compared to the upper tier guys, uh, and they're afraid of being held to scrutiny <laughs> and embarrassed. Yeah, no, I, I I completely feel you. And as long as you're willing to learn, that's all that matters. Um, because I have I like I've become like. I wouldn't say I'm, I've become an expert at like background art because I didn't know how to do background art and sorry for all the kerfuffle. I, I dropped my headphones twice. Oh, In fact, fine. you might have like a, a world first on your YouTube stream, which is I had to piss cause I've been drinking. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of like taking a break and going to the bathroom, I just peed in the Mason jar beside my, that's, a, that's inspiring. That's inspiring. <laughs> you, you like those uh, marathon runners that just keep running, even though they have to shit and they're like, Pouring, putting down their knees as they're hit, crossing the finish line. I've I've peed in strange containers for lesser reasons. I'm <laughs> really enjoying this conversation. Um, but yeah, as long as you're willing to learn, that's the stuff that is going to be your strength. Like when you say, like I'm not as good at um, drawing, you know, human characters as I am anthropomorphic characters. I wasn't as good at drawing anthropomorphic characters as I was human characters. I, you know, but I I said, you know, oh, I want to learn this. I want to, you know, I want to be able to. I want to. Um, to to be able to get across what i want in a way that is very um well designed in thunder chickens and since then uh, most uh, like a lot of the gigs i take on are anthropomorphic character gigs like um because it, it, it it's a strength now but it started as a weakness my backgrounds i used to not be good at drawing backgrounds i hated drawing them now i love noodling on city backgrounds and seeing how i can bend it i don't know if you saw the cyber frog bigfoot bill piece that i posted up on twitter recently where i kind of did a psychedelic curve to all the backgrounds where it sort of spirals all inward I did see that, and you know it's funny because I was looking looking at the background for the Thunder Chickens. I didn't notice a certain curve on some of the background. I did notice that. Yeah, and I wasn't good at that. I was never good at that. I always wanted to be able to do that. The only way I got to be able to do it successfully, at least in, in my mind, successfully, and and other people appreciate it. So I know I'm doing at least something right. Is that I knew that was my weakness, so I made my weakness strong. No, that, that's a good point, and that's something that I aspire to also is making my weaknesses strong, not just on paper, but also in terms of, um, like I said before, like my networking skills hasn't been the best, so I've been looking to 
strength in that department to um, form a community with other artists. Um, but yeah, as I, as I draw more of the story, um, I, I see some of my weaknesses become more and more uh, worked on and more improved on. So that's why I say that once I'm done with the first draft, I'm going to go back and probably redo certain pages to match the, uh, the more recent style of drawing that I've done. Uh, you know the trick, though. You know the trick, and and then this is my secret in terms of networking, in terms of promoting, is you need to separate yourself from what other people perceive you as, because people are never going to perceive you, no matter how well they know you. Even the closest people to you, even your wife, even your best friends, they're never going to get the whole picture. They're never going to know everything that's going on between those ears. So you need to have a separation between the character you play in terms of being public figure and who you are underneath. People don't know. I like, and nowadays I cry two, three times a day. You know what I mean? You wouldn't know that from speaking. And, and it's, and it's happy cry. You know, a lot of it has to do with pictures of my daughter. A lot of it has to do with a song that touches me and touches my heart. A lot of it has to do, with, I put on the crow, man, you want to see, you want to see a grown man who looks rough as shit, who got a shitty busted monster face, break down weeping, put on the crow. When I'm in the room, I will fucking sit there like, Oh, 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 Lord. oh it's so beautiful. No, you you just you need to have a separation between what you're presenting to other people and who you are and you need to know that they're never going to get the whole picture anyway so you don't have to show them the whole picture all you have to show them is what's necessary for you to do what you need to do kind of unrelated but it's kind of related to what you said you know how you said you, you cried at uh when you watched the crow yeah okay so my day began today and and are you familiar with the TV show Johnny Sacco and the Flying Robot? No, I'm not, but I'll have to check it out. Okay, well, it's an old a, a TV show from the 60s from Toei, uh, Japanese studio. Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I haven't seen the entire show. I've seen a couple episodes here or there, but I was going to make a point to um, uh, watch at some point. And then today I came across a YouTube clip from the final episode of the show, and we're entering spoilers. So if you haven't seen the show, I'm not responsible if you have not um, – See no, it's okay. I, I watched like dissections right. on YouTube of stuff right. that they I'm, right. I'm, just, I'm, stuff I haven't watched I'm, anymore. I'm just telling the people that are watching the video, so I'm gonna give them like a little little uh, heads up. So if you yeah. haven't seen Johnny Sacco and you want to, when I hold these figures up, the spoil is over. So I'm I'm gonna spoil right now just for the sake of telling the story. So here we go. So I saw the YouTube clip of the final episode, and it's the uh, it, the hero of the show, the, the giant robot that that save you know that fights monsters in every episode takes the main villain up into space and there's a comet headed towards earth and this comet is supposedly uh like the um it's supposedly taking in the, the the soul of the main bad guy and the only way to destroy the comet is for the hero to go head on into the comet and sacrifice his life which he ended up doing yeah and, and i was like well damn that's that's kind of depressing yeah and, and it's like i i you know it's, it's a kid's show and everything but i was like you know, I, I guess because I was emotional already from the fact that I I had I wasn't going to see my son this weekend, and um, yeah. and uh, the fact that um, you know, it, it's it's it, I don't want to say it's silly, but I will I will say that it it, it kind of tugged in my heart that this main character, you know, who's a you know uh, heroic, and then at the final episode he kills himself to save uh, the earth, and. Later on during the days, I kept thinking about that. And I kept playing the theme song to the show in my head. I said, like, you know what? Some of the greatest characters have to die. Yeah. I think of Optimus Prime from the animated Transformers film. If he didn't die, nobody would remember that movie. If he didn't die, yeah. Optimus Prime wouldn't be the legend he is today. Yeah. Uh, you think about Brandon Lee in The Crow. Um, years ago when I saw um, uh, Rapid Fire – at the end yeah. of that film, I cried because <laughs> yeah. I said, "I said to myself, man, that this is a guy that that had a whole future ahead of him. He had, he had a chance to be like his father and more, and he, you know, he he went out early, and that that made me cry." But that was his time to go home. That was his yeah. time to go home. That's the thing. You can put a bullet in Brandon Lee's chest, and I won't get into the conspiracy theories. I think it's a little bit odd that both him and 
his uh, father died in similar circumstances. Um, however, you can put a bullet in Brandon Lee's chest, but what you cannot do is kill the spirit that he created because that lives on. And people, there are kids, there are kids who are first discovering the movie The Crow. Now, kids that are 11, 12, 13, 14 years old who mm -hmm. are lost, who don't know what all this bullshit is that is existence and they watch that movie and it moves them to tears and it touches them and it makes them go yeah we can make the wrong things right again and you can't fucking kill that you and know what is, i mean and this is why i'm against them re remaking the film like they were they had jason momoa oh, on hand for yeah. that. as soon as he dropped out i said you know i said no there's some things you just can't remake like th that film in particular it has a meaning that transcends like our our context today like um it, it's just like uh, its meaning I, is meta contextual too because of his death i mean the whole movie is about death and rebirth and setting you know setting the wrong things right and I, i'm a man who lives like i'm dead already i had a bottle put up Side my head, a uh, whiskey bottle put upside my head uh, four years ago, enough times to cause a blood clot in my brain. And um, the, the, I'll just say that I ended up in my dad's house that night and the next morning, and my face was split open. I, when I say I have a shitty busted monster face, just look at pictures of me on Twitter. You'll see I have a shitty busted monster face and plenty of facial scars. Um, but my head was split open from the bridge of my nose all the way up my forehead. But I was going, no, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need to go to the hospital. And the very next day at seven o'clock in the morning, my dad getting ready for work came down and found me flopping around on the floor like a fish, sweating and pale white cold to the touch. They uh, life flighted me to Pittsburgh Presbyterian and my best friend from childhood was working as a nurse there. And he came down to see how I was doing and I like to think that maybe I didn't survive that because they were prepping the body bags. They were prep. They were ready to just put me in a bag and put me in a freezer. Um, but I like to think that it's as much possible that I survived as it is possible that I died. And this is some weird limbo that I'm living in where my soul is being judged based on what I choose to do with it and, and how I choose to influence people because both of those are just as valid of an experience. So I live like a man who is dead already, to quote Malcolm X, and that movie reaches me in a way that is beyond understanding. It's 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 feeling, it's it's beyond thought, it's beyond belief. And there there are kids out there who are just finding that movie and it is reaching them and you cannot kill that. You, you cannot remake that. You cannot reboot that. All you can do is respect that that was a part, a, a capture of three dimensional space time in a moment in time that was undefeatable that, 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 that cannot be denied, you know? I think we could definitely agree that that film is just, uh, I think it transcends uh, uh, culture and context just for the reasons oh, yeah. you, you stated. Um, it's interesting because uh, to bring it back a little bit about the, the whole conspiracy theory about Brandon Lee's death and everything. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen Game of Death? No, I haven't, but I'm familiar with it. Okay, well, um, very long story short. So Bruce Lee shot like... Actually, I may have, but it was years ago. Yeah, well, if, I don't know if you remember, but... Um, when Bruce Lee died, they had they went back and, and reshot footage surrounding the fight scenes he did for that film, and yes. it was released in 1978 with uh, Stan playing Bruce Lee. Anyway, so to in, in the story, the character that's playing Bruce Lee is actually a, fil a film star, and he's uh, in trouble with the mafia, with the with the with the, um, the uh, syndicate as they call it in the film, yeah. and, and they decide that since he's not going to be uh, signing and uh, playing ball with them, they decide they're going to kill him. So what they yeah. do the way they do it is they have one of their guys act as one of the extras on on set, and he actually replaces an empty shell with a real bullet. So when it when it comes time to shoot the scene where Bruce Lee's uh, character uh, runs toward to the crowd and is about to get shot, he actually gets hit with an actual bullet, and it's fascinating because um, that in a way is how Brandon Lee was taken out. Yeah, 
So yeah, no, and that's that's a warning to anybody mm -hmm. uh, doing art, especially in narrative form. And that's that. Uh, and I've found this from personal experience. If whatever you're doing in your art, you will suddenly see an infinite weirdness of replication and mirroring of that in your day-to-day -day life. Um, and, 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 and that's a warning that like, be careful because art is magic. And if you're an artist, you are inherently a magician, whether you realize it or not. And the art that you create is going to find a way to come off the page and it is going to get into your life. So if you have a character that you identify with, it is like your, um, uh, how would you say not analog, but your, your, um, uh, your symbol for you in a book, make sure that character has a good goddamn time. Cause I'm telling you, you put struggles up against that character. Look at Grant Morrison's uh, the invisibles. Um, whenever he had King mob go through the uh, sort of um, uh, torture and having his love, then all of a sudden his lung collapsed in real life. Um, whenever it went, what he did to this character, he realized he was doing to himself. Um, and now that's not to say don't, uh, pardon me, that's not to say don't put challenges against your character, but only put the challenges yeah. against your characters that you identify with in your own books. Only put the challenges that you're willing to confront in your real life because they will happen. So I think the word you're looking for is avatar. Yeah, Avatar. That's Avatar. What I was saying. Yeah. Uh yeah, it's it's because I, I my characters, um, they there's a few of them that actually end up in worse situations than I could ever possibly have. And then there's some that end up in better situations. So it's like a balance. But mm -hmm. um I look at it as okay, if the characters we, we create are extensions of who we are, or avatars, as you say, um what is the worst case scenario in, in for some of them? And what is the best case scenario for the others? So, so for example, so go ahead. Go ahead. So, for example, Solomon, uh, Solomon's Requiem, the main character Solomon, uh, is is this pathetic fuck up who just wants to work and pays bills, but he can't hold a job, and he's the one that's tasked with the unenviable task of of destroying a horde of zombies, and um, no matter how hard he tries and overcomes. He ends up never catching a ray because he'll overcome one obstacle and another one comes in place. And the film ends on a dire note because even though he'll overcome obstacles, he's in a position where he's in a much bigger battle than he realizes. And all he can do is laugh like a maniac. Um, for Hangman's News, the dagger, uh, his dream of, become, of returning back to a normal human life will never happen because he knows he's not human anymore. And he knows he's part of a bigger, bigger conspiracy. And he embraces that by realizing, okay, I will never be human, so I'm going to be the demon that they created me to be. Yeah. Um, on the flip side, uh, Gods of Perdition, you have the dad who has been alienated from his kid. You have the girl, the kid who conjures up monsters who she believes separated her from her dad, and they committed murder on her behalf without her realizing what's going on. You have the mother that, um, although she wants the best for her child, uh, is actively causing a wedge between her and her, her child and dad. And yet with all these monsters coming in and, and fighting and getting involved in all kinds of bloodshed murder and ultimately a big spiritual showdown, um, they realize the best thing for everyone is to come together but one common cause was just to raise their child and to overcome the evil in that child's life. And that, you know, that's one obstacle they, they overcome. So you can see that as an upswing. Uh, and with road warrior Drake, my main goal with road warrior Drake is <coughs> entertaining and to inspire. Yeah. And just to have a badass good time. So, yeah. so. And uh, you know that's a great that's a great place to be coming from where you you want to entertain and inspire because so many people are so worried about entertainment in and of itself um, when entertainment can be vacuous at best 
what really means something is when you are able to take that entertainment to another level. What's the worst case scenario? Um, I'd say one of the worst case scenarios is making a movie where um, you're being uh, hunted by the mafia and um, you are dealing with the Japanese mafia. Uh, I can't remember their name uh, at the moment. Uh, yeah, the Yakuza. You're dealing with the Yakuza at the moment and you make a movie about the mafia trying to kill a man and you end up dying. However, you can't diminish what um, Bruce Lee has done for the culture. You also can't diminish what Brandon Lee has done for the culture, even though he inherited his father's sins. And, you know, to quote, uh, be like water making its way through cracks. Do not be assertive, but adjust to the object. You shall find a way around or through it. If nothing within you stays rigid, outward things will disclose themselves. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. If you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. If you put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. If you put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now water can flow or it can crash. So be water, my friend. Now, however, the worst case scenario being that we do not any longer have Bruce or Brandon Lee with us, we have their spirit to inspire us. So the worst case scenario can also be the best case scenario, depending on your perspective. The worst case scenario is to not create because you're so blocked up and so depressed and so possessed by the demons of fear and doubt that you never try. That's the worst case scenario. Everything else is better than that. I don't care what story you're telling. I don't care what art you're creating. If you are creating art, whether it is great, whether it is good, whether it is mediocre at best, it is art and it is better than not doing because if you keep doing eventually you will do great things you know i work in the hospital as a nursing assistant and um it's amazing how many patients especially because I, I work with the pediatrics department and it's amazing how many patients um have that that creative drive like mm -hmm. even if it's just a little girl who wants to create slime mm -hmm. or the teenager that that just likes to draw but is very nonchalant about it because he doesn't want to attract attention uh but they there's elements of creativity from from patients and and it goes back to the depression part of it um with a lot of people that are depressed they they find that that as a means to to vent it's an outlet for them yeah but, but they they connect it as a form of pain not so much as something they want to share and it, they become so consumed with it that they absorb it they don't share with it and it, they end up dying or they get so sick that they they lose the the skill or they, they don't lose the skill they, they lose the um the uh i guess the drive with inspiration to share that skill yeah and it's like to me it's like it's the other side of that spectrum it's you got those that that will sh that will share that are inspired that are motivated uh, and will just share and fuck what people think, or you got the other side, which is they just absorb it and it shrivels and dies. Kind of like a flower that's not um, watered. I am right now sending you on Twitter a f short film called Ryan. Um, it is about an animator um, who uh, uh, was a uh, worked with the uh, CBC, I believe. Um, but he, he was an animator that very early in his um, in his life, he uh, had all this success and um, but he fell into alcoholism and um, he fell into uh, sort of uh, spiritual and mental disrepair where he couldn't escape from that. And um, it is a beautiful short film. I just sent it to you on Twitter um, and I hope you watch it in, in, it is about a guy making a, a animated documentary of this character who a, at one point was an influence in a in an inspiration to him and and it was so sad to see him fall out of the loop in such a way that he couldn't bring it back from the brink 
And that's the sad thing when you see your friends. And I have plenty of friends. I, and I'll call them out. Steve Musgrave. Steve motherfucking Musgrave. One of the greatest artists I've ever known. Who I am honored. Honored to have as a friend who lives but maybe six miles from me who doesn't answer my calls because he's so wrapped up in his own bullshit he's so wrapped up in his own demons he doesn't know how beautiful he is as a human fucking being that i i it is my job it is my purpose to be an example to guys like steve musgrave and say no you can do it too. You're fucking beautiful. The shit you create is so beautiful. It brings tears to my eyes that, that I need to create something even more beautiful. I need to create something even bigger that shows you that you can do it too. That maybe sets possibilities open for you so that you can be the well-rounded, fully functioning human being that you should be as God intended. And I do not use the three letters lightly. When I say God, I mean that source that Jack Kirby talked about. I mean the source from which he drew his inspiration from, which if you're familiar with Jack Kirby and his interviews at all, he talks about the source that no man knows, but every man feels inside. And that is the place where Jack Kirby created from. And that's where I'm trying to come from only so that I can show other motherfuckers love who are suffering deep down and within. You know, I definitely want to check that film out because I love films about artists. Uh, one of my favorite films is Ed Wood with Johnny Depp. Oh, yes. yes. I, I, I get so inspired when I see that film. Um, I, and I haven't seen this movie yet, but I read the book, The Disaster Artist. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I, I read the book. And I was like, you know, I can actually relate to some of what, what he talks about in that book. Um, but I love stories about artists and, and their 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 path to creation. I'm trying to think of another, another film that I saw about that, um, that uh, about an artist that, that, that was a creator. I'm trying to think. Oh, it was a, it was a doc. It was crumb. The film crumb. Oh yes. Crumb. Yes. Yeah, have you yeah. ever seen uh, American splendor? Uh, what is it? I have Harvey, uh, Harvey Picard. If you haven't just watch it again, either right. way. Right. It's right. Harvey Picard, And Robert crumb plays a huge part in that because Robert crumb drew Harvey Picard's early work right. uh, for American splendor. And, and yeah, it's part biopic part documentary and it's it's one of the most beautiful love letters to the creation of comics ever committed to film yeah and I, as I, a film and and a film and comic nerd i think you would appreciate it on so many levels if you haven't seen it if you have you need to see it again well i'm definitely gonna check it out because like those kind of projects really motivate me they really inspire me like that, that's the push that just says pick up your your pen and start creating like I yeah. love those kind of films. I love those kind of stories. Um, I hope to one day make my own story about a, a creator, even if it's a biography. But because I, I, I you know, I, I'm I'm a well-rounded human being. I have my flaws. I got my ups. I got my downs. But I think uh, my own particular journey could be an inspiration to other artists that that are afraid to take that step and say, you know what, I'm ready to open up my heart and say, this is my story. These are yeah. this is my world. This is my yeah. perspective, and I want to share that gift with you guys. Excellent. And old Harv didn't know what he was doing when he came to creating comics. He literally drew, and they show in the film, he drew stick figures on a page with like very rudimentary panels laid out. And he gave them to Robert Crumb and Robert Crumb then adapted that visually. And then he wrote the dialogue. And, and, and Harvey Picard's story is, it, it's the story of every artist where you just have this burning desire to make something. You don't know how to do it. You may not have all the skills necessary to do it, but you find a way. You will find a way just by doing it. Life will open up opportunities that you don't even imagine possible if you just keep doing it. It will find a way for you to do what you need to do because the universe is here to help you it loves you and it wants to see you thrive it doesn't want to just see you survive it doesn't just want to see you meander through years of muck what it wants to see is for you to be living your true self so that it can better understand itself through a limited scope of an infinite possibility yeah no absolutely um again just thinking about um uh the, the 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 inspiration to share and to give um 
Let's see, where was I? I was going so you said you said something that made me trigger a thought, and I wanted to, to express that thought. Uh, it'll come to me in a sec. It'll come to me. Um, yeah, don't don't force it. It'll come. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh, I ha and I had something good to say about that too. Um, what was it? Oh, I'm trying to think. What? Oh, I, I know what it was. Okay. Okay. So, um, there there is only one guarantee in this life that I've discovered for myself, and it might be true for other artists, but I think it's, I, I actually, I, I believe this is, this is my opinion. So if you think I'm wrong, you know, please share. But I think if you're an artist, there's only one guarantee in life. In my own walk, I, I've learned there's only one guarantee for myself. Uh, my marriage is not a guarantee. The relationship with my son is not a guarantee. It, it, even though people tell me no matter what, he's going to be your son. And I'm like, well, I'm my I'm my father's son, and I haven't had a relationship in years, so that that that's not a guarantee. Um, my job is not a guarantee. Um, being in this house is not a guarantee. Yeah. Uh, my health is not a guarantee. There's only one guarantee in my life, and that's my art. And I say that because again, I went years without drawing. That passion was, as far as I was concerned, dead and buried. It wasn't until I saw Thundercats roar and the comics gay stuff started to become prominent. That's when I got back into drawing and it's been coming out like Niagara Falls. And I realized, you know, as much as I had left art, art has never left me. Yeah. Uh, even when I wasn't drawing, I was making films. I still make films. And that's for all intents and purposes, that's still my number one passion. But it's still art, it's still storytelling, and it's still crap that goes with it. And much of what I've learned with drawing comics, I apply to filmmaking. But the point being is that no matter how much I try to turn my back to it, uh, and the reasons for that is, to me is like it's not reasons at all. But my my me turning my back to my craft and my artwork has never stayed uh, permanent. It's it's always been temporary, and I've always managed to find a way back to it because I can never suppress that drive or suppress that that love and motivation to create yeah. and as i was and as i draw road warrior drake i've realized this is the only guarantee not so much this comic but what's coming out of my hand onto the paper that's the guarantee <laughs> because <clears throat> if i end up homeless on the street <clears throat> and my wife leaves me tomorrow i can still take uh, a pencil or whatever and still draw or maybe a marker drawing a wall or something. I'm still drawing. I'm still creating. That's that will always be there. That that, yeah. that drive will always be there. And I'm at a point where I've learned to not not just embrace it, but to never let it go and to never apologize for it. So if I spend hours working on something, whether it's a comic book or film, whatever, I have no guilt because that's my guarantee. That is my gift that I want to share with the world. And that's the gift that I want to share with people. And if I don't do that, if I don't fulfill that call and embrace it, you may as well call me dead because I will never find happiness or fulfillment in any any part of my life because no other part of my life is a guarantee. Yeah, yeah. And and that's – I'm going to send you – Um, I've got it up like just in my uh, – browser so that i remember to send it to you uh what i call the gospel and that's uh of uh, dr steel which you're probably not familiar with and i don't blame you um he was a independent musician who is in retirement now um and he created some of the most beautiful music and some of the most beautiful branding uh, and, and especially the branding in terms of um, any creator or artist. And one of the things, um, one of the things he says is uh, in, in one of the Dr. Steele uh, PSAs is uh, he goes, hallelujah, we have a purpose. No, we have possibility. And that is more powerful than purpose 
possibility, the infinite possibility that you have is way more powerful than any sort of purpose, any predestined destiny that you can imagine because a predestined destiny is one path and one strict path where you say, I have to do this. I must do this. I am called to do this. And yes, me, myself, I am called to do something. I am called to build other motherfuckers up. I am called to show love to motherfuckers suffering deep down and within but it is the infinite possibility in me that is way more fucking powerful because i can do anything i can choose to do anything and that's you too and i'm pointing my finger to the screen looking at you on here you beautiful motherfucker and i'm going look you have infinite possibility your possibilities are infinite there's no limits to them you may have a purpose but you but beside that purpose is the infinite possibility of of I can do anything. It's just a matter of choosing the fig off the tree, as I'm trying to remember the poet that says it. You know, um, you're sitting below a fig tree and you're hungry. And so you're 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 going like, oh well, I should just grab a fig and eat it. But every fig is another decision, another decision in what uh what you should do with your life. Um oh, I wish I could remember the poet so I could credit them properly but every fig on the tree is another decision of what you should do with your life one fig is becoming a nurse one fig is becoming an artist one fig is becoming a firefighter one fig is becoming a police officer one fig is, is just being a family man and just showing love and you sit there and you try to choose between all these figs and as you don't choose because you can't make a decision, the figs rot and they fall off the trees and they become inedible. So as you sit there and not choose, you sit there and you watch the possibilities, the infinite possibilities fall away. So all I'm trying to do is tell all the motherfuckers, just make a decision and run with it. Sometimes you're going to be wrong. Sometimes you're going to be on the wrong path. So, And that's necessary because it's only being on the wrong path that lets you know when you're on the right path. So pick a fig and eat that motherfucker. And don't be afraid to make a mistake. Exactly. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Yes. And I'm trying to think of the. I'm trying to think of which musician this a quote. But uh, he said um, when you he when he would hit a bad note, he would hit it and hit it loud. Said he would never forget it. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And, and, that, and that's the thing. Like, like, don't be afraid to take risks. Don't be afraid to to uh, produce a bad piece of work because that's the only way you'll know how what not to produce. So you can always go back and do um. The opposite of that, and 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 work on your strengths, and um, you know, and and, and then go back and, and fix your weaknesses. Oh yeah, the only way you're going to produce any great piece of work is by producing several subpar pieces of work, not bad pieces of work per se. You might, you know, from the beginning, you might the first thing you make might be good. It might not be great, but when compared to what you want out of this creative endeavor, it might be subpar. But the only way you're going to know what is great out of what you can do and what you will do eventually if you keep doing it is by producing subpar pieces of work that you then can go back and say, oh, I could have done this better. So that the next time you're going, I'm going to do this better. I'm going to fix this mistake that I did in the first pass. I'm going to and, and don't retread the same ground. And, and I'm guilty of it, too. I've there's stuff like special edition that I've left you know, rot on the vine simply because I know that when I can finally do it right, I will. Um, and that's going to be part of the uh, uh, illegal redistribution of art that I'm, I'm releasing. Um, but the, the only way you're going to make something great, great is by making a thousand pages of something below what you know you can do, below what is acceptable for you, because it is only by producing what is unacceptable for you that you realize and come to know what is acceptable for you and what is beautiful and what is great about what you can produce in this flawed, angry, disruptive, envious fucking world. Absolutely. And when this world turns to shit, at the very least, we can create beautiful works of art so people can escape. And that's what art is supposed to be. It's supposed to be escapist. It's not supposed yeah. to be, that's supposed to be, 
I mean, it, it could be a reflection of reality, but it's not supposed to be reality. It's supposed mm -hmm. to be our escape into something, as you said, something magical, because that's what we are. We're yeah. magicians. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and escapism gets such a bad rap in terms of a term. Um, escapism... There are two worlds. There's the outer world, that which we are confronted with and manifests itself physically, um, the manufactured clockwork orange that we live in, if, if you want to view it that way. But then there's the inner world. And the inner world can be far more real than the outer world because when Steve Jobs came up with the idea for the iPhone, it was not real. It was an idea. It was not real as we define real. However, that idea became a multinational conglomerate of corporation that makes billions of dollars per year. That idea, that unreal thing became something that is so physically manifest and that so many people are dependent on nowadays and so many people line up outside Apple stores for the new iPhone when it comes out in such an absurdist fashion that you wouldn't imagine doing that for even concert tickets for your favorite artist, for your favorite musician. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. <Sorry. laughs> you, <laughs> you would say that's silly, but people do it. Well, you, you're you're actually reminding me of my night tonight because the last few nights I've been having a real bad cough. I think it's because of my allergies and the, the change of climate. Yeah. Well, either way, like I'm I'm pre I'm preparing for another sleepless night tonight. So uh, I uh, enjoy the conversation, but I just realized, you know what? It's gonna be a little long night. But maybe not. Maybe I'll just uh, sleep sleep nicely. Um. Why well, I know well because this conversation has motivated me enough where it's like, oh wow, like, um. I could say that what I'm doing is beautiful, the, the artwork that I'm drawing and um, the work that I'm producing. And, um, you know, I've learned a lot from you and, and listen to your perspective. And um, I definitely can appreciate a lot of what you're saying. And, um, you know, I share a lot of the, the goals and ideals that you have as well, yeah. uh, pushing other artists, encouraging other artists. And the encouraging part of it, I mean, I'm not the kind of guy that believes in, in – What's what's the term? Um, positive reinforcement. But I believe I definitely believe in, a, in a, any form of encouragement. Where if you know somebody can be good at something, the only way people can really be good at anything, aside from them just doing it, is getting that push from from others to say, you know what, you got this, you can do this. Um, because we, as people, as human beings, we're relational beings. We feed off relationships from other people we feed off that vibe whether it's a romantic vibe a sexual vibe or uh, any kind of platonic positive vibe we feed off of that and it motivates us to be better it could because if someone thinks that we're better than what we really are we kind of want to meet that expectation and um i find that more effective than saying to somebody you know you're you're not gonna do this. Like you, you know, you you're gonna fuck this up. I already know you're gonna you're gonna mess this up. It's not it's not gonna happen. Um, you're not gonna go farther with this. And believe me, I've I've kind of gotten some of that with um, my film work and now with my comic. Not well, that's much with my comic, but I I I've gotten a little bit of that where it's like, you know, okay, you're spending all this time doing your comic book, but you got other stuff you haven't done. And and I try to, you know, balance out with responsibilities and my artwork, but, um. Even though I'm already motivated enough to push this and to meet my set of goals, which is by December have the comic book finish and then work on the second draft and then work on setting the um, the uh, either the Indiegogo campaign or going through my other website, Television, to do the fundraiser there. The point is that I do have a step-by-step -step plan that I'm going to, to pursue, and I'm going to pursue it regardless of whether or not I get the motivation or not. I'm going to pursue it because all of this is leading up to that and leading up to the point where I'm ready to now actually produce hard cover or hard copies of this story and actually become what I never thought I would be, which is a professional comic book artist. 
Okay, while you were uh, saying that, I was pissing in a mason jar again um, because I didn't want to interrupt this beautiful conversation that we're having. Um, so I'm going to tell you a very quick story, um, very concisely as I can. Um, the world is so cruel and so mean and so damned that we don't need negative reinforcement. The world provides us with every amount of negative reinforcement, whether it becomes comes from the media, whether it comes from those people that you love, which I have experienced recently where I quit my job. One of my closest friends at the job who I bought my weed from and hung out with and worked with on side gigs won't even return my phone calls now simply because I was able to break my shadow and he did, doesn't feel like he can, um, that he won't even return my calls now. He's so offended. The world is so full of negative reinforcement. Um, we don't need to provide any more of that. It's there. It's inherent in the system. However, with so few words, with so little encouragement, we can Get another motherfucker on the path where they say, I can do this. You know what? I don't I don't even believe I can do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best to do my best. And that's all we can do. You know what I mean? The, 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 the world can be so awful sometimes. And all it takes is to turn on the evening news or the 24 hour news station to see that the world can be fucking awful. But there is so little light out there. But however, it may not be much light as Charles Bukowski says, but it beats the darkness. So all we need to do is just bring another motherfucker up to just say, no, you can do this. No, what you're doing is beautiful. No, what you're doing is fucking great. Keep doing it, please. I want to see what you do next. That's all we need to do. You know, that's all we say that what we see on the news is awful, but I don't know what's worse. What we see on the news or the people that report the news. So it's like, I avoid the news altogether now. Like I, I, I just, I try not to watch any of the news because um, it pretty much now exploits the dark side of us and it, and it exploits the negative of, of us. Well, the, and, the medium is the message. So when it comes to 24 hour news, you cannot separate the message that they are conveying from the medium they are conveying it with. They are trying to get your attention. And the thing that gets our attention the most is fear. So, I would recommend anybody listening to this, if you're listening to this, if you've gotten this far into the stream, please cut the fear out of your life. Cut the, the, the emotional vampires out of your life. Cut the news out of your life and find, you know what? Go subscribe to Reddit slash, what, what is it? Uh, um, uh, oh God, I can't remember it. But just so subscribe to RA or subscribe to, to um, um, what is it? Heartfelt memes or something like that. It, it, but subscribe. Like, look, filter your reality tunnel so that all you're bringing in is positive. Because there's so much negative out in the world, and it affects so many people. And we need to fight against that. It is a battle on a spiritual level. It is a battle for your life. If you're taking in nothing but negativity and you're depressed and you're lost, then that is a battle for your life because Lord knows whether tomorrow you're going to get the balls to do something as terrible as put a razor to your wrist or put a gun to your head. And I know I'm cracking up a bit, but I'm serious about it. It is a battle for your life. You need to know that there is beauty out there. And sometimes it may not be much light, but it beats the goddamn darkness every fucking time. And I think that is, in essence, what Comic Skate is. It's beating the darkness out and trying to promote beauty and trying to promote the, the I guess you could say the light. Um, fun. It is fun. Exactly. Fun. The, fun. the fun. fun is underrated. Yeah. Yeah, oh, it's underrated. underrated. Yeah, very underrated. Very underrated. And 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 watching these recent movies, there's no fun in them. Like the last Star Wars film. I mean, I don't know if you're a fan of the Last Jedi, but um, I hated that movie because it wasn't fun. 
and, and see when I saw the last Jedi, I was dealing with a lot with my daughter because it came out around the time of my daughter's birthday. And it was before that I was able to get back in contact with her and her mother and, and be nice and, and, and try to, you know, do things the right way. Cause I've been doing things the wrong way for a long time and I've been justifying it for the right reason. So I, when I watched the last Jedi in theaters, I just felt nothing. However, I think that like, 10 years down the road, I'll probably appreciate The Last Jedi a lot more um, simply because it does break a lot of the boundaries of what we imagined a Star Wars movie could be. Uh, Luke, everybody has a problem with Luke in that film. No, I've been there. I've been Luke in, in The Last Jedi where I isolated myself because I just didn't want to cause any more pain. And, and that's where Luke is in that movie. And I think that's honorable, I, I, if not wrong-headed. Yes, it's wrong-headed um, because you have to interact with the world. You have – the game is there. The drama is there. You have to be involved in, in it all if you're going to be effective in any way. But – it shows something which even at your darkest time, Luke still put himself out there in a way that he died for simply for what he believed was right. And I think that's something that's missing from most people's interpretation of The Last Jedi, which is Luke, in the end, he stood for what he believed in. See, I, I like that perspective. Um I think you're more positive about it than I am because um, I, don't, I don't think there's a problem with with the with the type of character that's portrayed in the film because yeah. we all go through that kind of period where we're like grumpy and we're like we're very um uh, what's the word we're very uh what's the word despondent. Not, not, despondent. yeah despondent negative um I want to say uh was it, it, it's at the tip of my tongue but um cynical. Yes, cynical. cynical. Yes. yes, yes. We all, yes. We all go through periods where we're cynical. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with that. My, my problem with his <clears throat> portrayal, and 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 I, like I said, I like your perspective. I, I, I totally can relate to that. Absolutely. But my problem is that, um, in Luke's case, he was a very hopeful character. By the time we left the Return of the Jedi, he had already saved the galaxy. He redeemed his father. So I think we were open. To see where his life took him, but I don't think anybody expected for his life to take him to a point where he totally disavowed the Jedi. He totally cut himself off from the Force, and he totally, uh, for lack of a better term, threw away his destiny based okay. on uh, on um, on a vision that he had of his own nephew. Who Are you was... familiar with movies with Mikey? I've heard actually. Um, yeah, I I think he did a he did one with Thanos, did he not? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, he's done lots. He's he's right. a beautiful human being. And in fact, I'm going to bring this up just mm -hmm. so that I remember to send it to you. Much with the the gospel of uh, Doctor Steel, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to make two or three points. I'm not sure how many yet. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, first off, the um, the thing with the Last Jedi is, do you know that when The Empire Strikes Back came out, it was uh, critically panned? It probably was. I I, I was about um. It was. It five was years old. I was five years old when it came out, so I don't remember that much of it. But uh, no, it, yeah. it was definitely critically panned. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I think that 10 years from now that the last Jedi might actually be held up in regard as well as, um, the empire strikes back. However, I'm interested in seeing what JJ Abrams says. I think JJ Abrams will do a better job on the third film than they did with, um, uh, with uh, the Return of the Jedi, because Return of the Jedi was to sell toys. Let's be honest; um, it's 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 the weakest of the original trilogy, and I put um, the Force Awakens right behind that, but only because of you know uh, it, it was grandfathered in the original. You can't put the Force Awakens ahead of Return of the Jedi. There are so many good things in it, but there's so many bad things in it. Let's be honest. Um, but when Empire Strikes back came out it was critically panned it was seen as a betrayal of what the first film did and 
I think that a decade or now or so down the road, the that uh, the last Jedi might be perceived as well as Empire Strikes Back, dependent wholly on what J.J. Abrams does with the last film. Um, and but I try to see the best in things. I try to see the best in people. I I think that that. Um, we should just, and this has been my motto as of late, let's see what happens because you can't do anything else. The, the universe is, uh, is uh, what's the word? Uh, I'm trying to think of it. The universe is uh, non-simultaneously apprehended. The universe is non-simultaneously apprehended. So interacting processing is all I tune in. Let's see what happens. See what happens, interact, process, go from there. I hope that the third film is as great as The Phantom Menace was to me. I hope it's better. And I hope that um, and I believe, J.J. I, Abrams he filmed Super 8 in my hometown. I watched them film it. I, I believe he is a master at his craft, even if he falls short sometimes and does a lot of lens flares. Um, but I think that comparatively to most of the mediocre stuff that's out there, he's doing really amazing stuff and i i can only hope that he carries the weight necessary to do a third film that is beautiful and that that not only uh not only um avenges what the last jedi did regardless of ideological politics regardless of identity politics but then creates something that builds on it in a way where you go all oh, Oh, he did something amazing here. Because I think, like I said, I think that it's very possible that 10 years from now, The Last Jedi might be reconsidered in the same uh, regard as The Empire Strikes Back. Well, I, mean, I think that uh, we all hope for something better. I think deep down, I think deep down, nobody wants to, to anticipate a bad film. I think we, we all want to be entertained. I think we want to be inspired like i'm looking forward for example i'm looking forward to seeing what how they conclude the infinity war story yeah uh, i have some reservations but i'm hopeful um so i'm i'm looking forward to that and i'm of course if you haven't figured by now i'm looking forward to the godzilla film that's coming out next year uh that trailer blew me away oh so, oh are oh, they doing more the um uh, what is it guillermo del toro's legendary pictures thing uh as of right now, from what from what I'm understanding, that they, they're not pushing that monster verse. I mean, they push the monster verse thing, but it's it's with Godzilla. But Kong. it's the same. It's not like Godzilla, like uh, uh, Toki or whatever. It's not like OG Godzilla. It's American Godzilla. Correct? Right, right. American yeah. Godzilla, and they got Rodan, Gitter, and Mothra now in this next film. Oh, that sounds good. I'm oh, going to watch. Oh, you yeah. didn't see the, you didn't see the trailer for that? I I haven't even seen the the first Godzilla that they did. Oh. Uh, um, you know, I'll I'll you send you the trailer. Out. You have to see the trailer. The teaser trailer. I'll, I'll tell you right now. Dude. The teaser trailer for this Godzilla film coming up actually moved me to tears. Oh, oh, I'm gonna have yeah. to check that it, out. It, there. It's because they used the song Claire de Lune. They the way they used oh. that song. Oh, oh, oh I, yeah. Just thinking about it gave me gave me goosebumps. It still gives me goosebumps. So I'm like, I'm I'm hoping that that film is as mind-numbingly epic as the trailer made it out to be um so i'm looking forward for, to that film for sure but i'll send you the trailer to that so you can, and you'll see what i'm talking about it's actually yeah, very yeah, yeah. very beautiful trailer very beautiful trailer um but uh otherwise um you know i i definitely uh when, when it comes to art i i always look for the best i always um uh, want to see the best i want to be motivated by other artists um you know, uh, looking at your comic, I, I, I was like, okay, wow, this guy, is, he's pretty good. And that motivates me to, to be better than what I am. Um, I'm, so. that's, man, I'm, an, I'm, I'm honored to be in that position because I've been on the other side of that where I was looking at other artists being, man, like, like I said uh, on Twitter the other day, the, whenever I posted up that Cyber Frog uh, um, Bigfoot Bill thing, um, I, I, the last time I looked at a Cyber Frog comic, I was a teenager and I was wishing I could draw that good. I was wishing I could. And now I'm like, I'm confident enough in my abilities where I'm like, okay, yeah, I, you know, I think I, I maybe, 
you know, it's 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 easy to compare oneself to another artist and fall short in your own mind. But I know what my skills are, and I know what I do well, and I'm I'm happy with it. When I'm done with a piece, nowadays most of the time I'm happy with it. So that the, the fact that I can be that for any other artist, I don't care who, it, it moves me to tears because I've been there, and I know what it's like to want to want so bad to be able to create something as beautiful as what you have in your mind but your hands don't work right or you don't have the skills or i know what it's like to be there and the fact that like you don't understand thank you for telling me that because to know that i've inspired another artist is what i do this for to know that another guy looks at my stuff and goes i wanted to be able to do that that's why i do this thing it's not for money even though that's unnecessary evil in this world um it's not for notoriety it's that some person can look at it and go oh my god i want to be able to do that and then strive to do it that's that's really where it's at and eventually one day i'm i promise you brother i promise you you are going to look back on this conversation when another motherfucker goes i saw what you did on this and i said i want to do that and you're gonna go oh shit that's the cycle you know yeah 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 and, and um just a word out to other artists and and, and take it from what you just said um Whatever you translate from your mind into your hand, that's you. That's your style. Be uh, you should embrace it. And even if it if, if it's not copying your favorite artist, whatever you can create, that's your style. Someone will love it, and you'll build an audience with it. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So there we go. The <laughs> but uh, but you know, this has been a very uh very inspiring conversation. I've actually learned quite a bit, and I actually feel very motivated right now. So good, I'm glad. Yeah. That's the least I can do, man. Is 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 motivated motivated on the motherfucker? Well, just create, be keep keep creating because uh, I'm definitely going to be following what what you do with Thunder Chickens. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess um whatever you whatever you do, let me know. I'll I'll, I'll promote it. I'll push it and um. Curious sure. to see uh, how far this goes. And do you have, oh, and do you have any other um, ideas for other projects you want to do uh, once you go past Thunder Chickens? Well, there's well uh, Thunder Chickens. I'm not sure where that's going to go in terms of the linear time stream. Um, it's going to get finished, and it's going to be as good as I can make it, and that's all I can promise. Um, however, yeah, I've been dabbling. Well, I've dabbled in music for. Um, at least a decade and I'm currently working with uh, about five other musicians to create a um, multi-genre mixtape um, I'm also good doing uh, what I refer to as and will continue to refer to as the illegal redistribution of art mm -hmm. um, I can't go too much into that right now because I'm working mm -hmm. out the details with a right. certain someone mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know I might get sued for it but uh, it'll be worth it um, and the uh, and yeah like let's see oh yeah pinnacle tentacle pinnacle tentacle I didn't even mention um, on spreadshirt spreadshirt pinnacle tentacle uh, hashtag pinnacle tentacle if you want to find it I've hashtagged it with that it's um, a magic spell masquerading as an art project masquerading as merchandise on spreadshirt right now but I'm about to launch it on several other uh, t-shirt platforms. And yeah, from there, um, I'm just going to take some of the art that I truly believe in that I, I think is worthwhile that I've made. And I'm going to do some print uh, print shops uh, in places that I can because it's hard to do print that's based on derivative material of other people's work um, without it getting, you know, copyright claimed, especially on Spreadshirt. They're, they're, I mean, they're great people. I 
DJ Kaufman, a buddy of mine, works for them, and and he has nothing but praise to say about them. But they live in a a, a litigious world where it's easy to sue a motherfucker. Um, so yeah, look if you, if you're interested in what I do, please. I'm Bad Ankle Bill. Uh, B A D A N K L E B I L L on every social media platform on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, I haven't been able to change it on YouTube because I don't have 100 subscribers yet. So it's Madcap Comics on there M A D C A P C O M I C S, Madcap Comics on YouTube, but Bad Ankle Bill everywhere else. And yeah. Please, if you dig what I do, let me know. And I, you know, if, if 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 what you're doing, if I like what you're doing, and if I can feel it, I will share it as much as possible. I'm a retweeting motherfucker. So yeah, what I see you doing on on Twitter, I'll be sharing as much as I possibly can. And anybody else, if you're hearing this, if you've lasted this long, if you've you know got through the gauntlet of our words. Please make something beautiful. Make something as beautiful as you can because I need to see you doing that for me to do my shit. If you are inspired at all by my shit, I need to see you making your shit so that I got more shit to feed on. Words to live by, and I think that's the best way to end this stream with those words. So um, I, we're definitely going to invite you back again at some point because I'm sure there's a lot that we could discuss more because – um like, you don't uh, even know. I ain't uh, even uh, opened the book yet. I just cracked the pages. Yeah, well, I, I'm gonna put a bookmark because uh, we're gonna uh, at some point go go back and continue this. So, um, um, but anyway, uh, I appreciate you giving me the time. This has actually been very inspiring. I appreciate I think you giving me the time. That's the thing. I like you don't understand. For me, I'm like, oh, somebody invited me on for an interview. Oh, fuck yeah! I want to spout the bullshit that's in my head as much as possible, and I can only hope that people feel it. So I appreciate you. Thank you for this. Well, I, I think we both should share the fuck out of the, this link and try to get other people to listen to it because I think between you and me, we've given some good advice on up and coming artists. Ultimately, it can be something in a couple words don't fear no fear no okay. doubt they're demons don't listen to them they that's ain't it. worth it that's it that's it all right my friend thanks for coming on and uh, have a good night and we will chat soon thank you brother all, all right, right you have a great one hey and remember kiss that wife for, for me you know <laughs> what i mean give her a big old hug if grab she, her as tight as you can and show her love all right if she's not too tired because i'll be like what are you doing because I, I i'm more of the kissy type than she is she's, she's she likes to say that i'm the chick of the relationship like no i just like the kids i just I, that's I'm all just, right she'll feel it she'll know where um, all right, all right. Absolutely. All right close out the hangout. You, my, and to end it, much love and infinite mojo to you. If you're hearing this, and even if you aren't, I love you. So does God. Do what you do. Much love. Same. Like likewise. Peace out, brother. <laughs>